Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 149 of the Tick Bootcamp podcast. The title of today's interview is Mystery in Style, an interview with Liana of Panthea in Style. My name is Richard Johannesson. And I'm Matt Sabatello. This is a very interesting and almost classic superhero story where we have a woman living in the Soviet Union. She was radiated because she lived in close proximity to Chernobyl, immigrated to the United States with a weakened immune system, and ultimately came in contact with Lyme disease, which she went undiagnosed for many years until she finally put together a good team of doctors and health coaches. And Rich, even once she got diagnosed, she continued to have problems getting proper care. She was treated with antibiotics, but did not feel better. After several years, she decided to put together this team of medical professionals and health coaches to finally get her on the right track. After the last few months of treating with a variety of doctors and health coaches, including Daisy White, she's made major progress and is doing much better today. So Matt, in true superhero style, this is a woman who is now reaching out to the Lyme disease community and teaching them what she's doing, especially in the mindset arena, to heal. She's using color, she's using style, she's making sure that she's always properly dressed when she's going for her treatment, and she's doing everything she can to maintain her dignity and to heal. So Matt, without further ado, it is a pleasure to introduce Liana of Panthea in Style. Hey, Liana, and welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, we're really blessed to have you, and we've been uh, big fans of yours for a long time, so we are just really excited to introduce you to the Tick Boot Camp community, so thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule. Oh, thank you so much. So, Liana, can you talk to us about your background? Where do you currently live? I am currently living in the Bay Area in California. And how long have you been a resident of the Bay Area? Uh, about six years. And where did you live prior to moving to the Bay Area? Ohio. I lived there for about five years. And talk to us about your time before you lived in the Midwest in Ohio. Uh, well, originally I came from Ukraine in 96. Um, I came to New York. So I lived on the East Coast for a bit, um, then Los Angeles, and then Ohio. Now, I understand you also spent some time in Connecticut. Am I correct about that? Yes, New York and Connecticut um, were the states where we uh, lived. Okay. So let's talk about your childhood in Ukraine. What was that like? Um, well, it was, uh, it was a wonderful childhood. I had, uh, you know, my, my parents were really loving. And um, I grew up in communist country. And um, even with everything going on politically, um, they gave me a great uh, upbringing. Um, we had, um, unfortunately, in 1986, we did have Chernobyl, a nuclear accident, um, and I guess we were all somewhat exposed, I would say. So Just let's no let's talk about your life in um, in Ukraine prior to Chernobyl. Um, what? was your life like meaning what kinds of dreams did you have what was your educational experience like and what was your family life like um normal family you know me and my, my brother um growing up just uh, going to school i also was a gymnast for a bit of time i was a dancer um i at one point i wanted to be an astronaut but i think everybody in Soviet Union wanted to be one. <laughs> um, but other than that, you know, I, I had a lot of dreams and, um, you know, and aspirations in life. And what was the educational experience like in a communist country? Uh, it was difficult. It was a very hard um, system where, you know, we studied math and physics and chemistry very early on. Um, you know, the need to succeed was very, very strong. And, um, you know, that was, that was kind of the thing. Now, what was your, I guess, your sort of environmental experience? Meaning, did you spend a lot of time outside? Um, what was your community like? Yes, you know, uh, me and my friends, usually my, um, my neighbors, uh, we would just hang out in, um, in the yard of the uh, building we were living in. 
And we're just climbing trees, you know, riding bikes, um, really active. Definitely, you know, having fun outside as much as we could. Now, at that time in your life, did you know anything about ticks, Lyme disease, no. or any other tick diseases? No, no, absolutely not. Uh, was Were there any educational courses or health classes or anything that you took that would lead you to understand how to protect yourself from ticks and or Lyme disease? No, no, not in Soviet Union, no. So talk to us about um, Chernobyl and, um, and, and, and what impact that had on your life. Um, that was in 1986, and I was uh, five and a half or so. Um, you know, when it happened, we didn't really know anything. It was kind of secret. You know, the government didn't tell us anything. We were out and about, um, you know, playing as usual or doing our usual things. And when they finally told us, um, my, my parents moved me and my brother to Moscow for a few months. Um, and after that, you know, we came back and um, just continued to live our life. And the government said there was nothing, you know, there was no issue. Radiation was all fine, you know, everything's great. Um, after that time, actually, um, you know, I turned a little bit of yellow color and, um, my neighbor's uh, friend's mom came over and said, oh, it's something, something. I, could, I, I mean, I can't even remember. I was like six at that time. And uh, they told me to be in the dark room for a month. So that was basically the treatment. <laughs> so I have no idea what happened or, you know, I'm thinking it's, it was due to radiation. Um, so, the, yeah, that was my experience. So, uh, Leanna, how far did you live physically from Chernobyl when the uh, nuclear meltdown took place? I lived in Kiev, and um, that's the capital of Ukraine. Um, so to Chernobyl, maybe 100 miles or so. I could be mistaken, I'm, you know. But, you know, the whole, I think uh, the whole Ukraine um, was covered up in that. And, I mean, Western Europe was was the first actually saying, hello, people, there's radiation coming out of you. What's happening? Um, so I think it was, it was pretty widespread. Now, did you have any other health effects from your, your exposure to the radiation uh, between the time that you were initially exposed until present? Um, no, my, my brother did have some thyroid issues, actually, but me personally, other than turning yellow, weirdly, uh, for a bit, I didn't have anything, um, you know, for years. Uh, later on, I, I did develop some thyroid issues, so possibly it's from that, you know, doctors, some of my doctors are open-minded about this and saying, you know, that could have been the, one of the contributing factors to my immune dysfunction. Okay, so let's get to that. Uh, and, and I don't want to run too far ahead, but you know, the thought yeah. I had, of yeah. course, was, do you believe that your exposure to the radiation during your childhood had an impact on your immune system and therefore made you more vulnerable to tick diseases that you later came in contact with when you moved to the US? Yes, absolutely. So let's talk about how long you lived in Ukraine or in the USSR and when you finally immigrated to the US. Yeah, I immigrated around, uh, it was in 96, um, so about 10 years after Chernobyl. Um, I came to New York and I lived in New York for a few years and then moved to Connecticut. So how old were you approximately when you came to the US? I was 15 and a half. And did you come here by yourself or did you come here with your family? What were the circumstances of your immigration? My mom, uh, my brother and my, my mom came first and um, it took my mom a while to get some do documentation and then she invited me as her daughter and I came. So it was a few years. And what type of work did your mom do when she came here to the U.S.? She was cleaning apartments. 
And what kind of work did your mom do before she came to the U.S. when you were living in the USSR? She, uh, she worked uh, at, in government. She was a government worker for a communist party, <laughs> um, a planner. They, you know, it was all very complicated in the communist world, you know, all these titles and stuff. But um, uh, she worked with uh, different factories in the city, you know, planning the um, production and all of that. So talk to us about what the experience was like to immigrate here to the U.S. when you were 15 years old. Actually, I was very excited to come see mom because <laughs> she lived here for a few years and, uh, you know, I lived with my dad back home and um, I couldn't wait to come and uh, experience living in the U.S. I was very excited. And uh, did your experience when you arrived meet your expectations? Yes, I loved everything. It was you know, the freedom of everything was just shocking and it's just exactly what I was looking for, forward to. So give us some, some specific detail on that, meaning how was it so much more free and liberating to live in the U.S. as opposed to living in um, the USSR? Uh, well, it was a very rigid system, you know, you were supposed to, to conform. That was kind of the, you know, the, you know, you grew up in this, you have to act a certain way, you have to be a certain way, you know, in school you have to wear the same thing, you know, it just was very conforming. Whereas here it was, I don't know, and people were so friendly and were smiling at me and I thought that was the weirdest thing, even in New York. <laughs> Everybody was nice and I was like, wow, <laughs> and very welcoming and it was just and then, you know, when I went to school, it was like, oh, yeah, you choose the, you know, what you want to study. You know, there's some things, there's some subjects you have to, but there are also freedom of choosing, you know, this or that. And um, even though I did go to, it was a religious school, but it was actually freer than growing up in USSR. So you moved from communist Russia to the Lime Belt in the U.S. Uh, when you <laughs> arrived in 1996. And yep. I guess the first question I have for you is, with part of the freedom that you um, that you enjoyed in the educational system here in the U.S., were you prepared at all for living in the Lime Belt? Meaning, did your educational um, tools, uh, whether they be health classes or any other courses you take, alert you to the fact that you were living in a community that had ticks and Lyme disease? No, nobody ever mentioned it, ever. So... What type of things were you doing here in the U.S.? Meaning, were you going outdoors? Were you doing any hiking? Uh, what what kinds of things were you doing out um, outside? And uh, and when do you believe you were first exposed to ticks? So my friends and I went um, upstate a lot uh, for Ukrainian festivals. Uh, we um, slept in tents. We partied. We drank a lot of vodka, and we you know that was our fun. And I, I believe that's when I was exposed. And so, how old were you when you believe you were exposed to uh, Lyme disease? About uh, 18, 17, 18. And um, do you recall having been bitten by a tick at any time? No. So, talk to us about how your symptoms began to develop around 17 or 18 after enjoying the outdoors here on the East Coast? So my symptoms um, started developing, um, yeah, around that time, I started having brain fog, I, uh, joint pain. I found myself unable to walk up the stairs without being in excruciating pain. Um, I had a stick shift car and my my right hand, I would be in pain changing the gears. It was very difficult for me. Um, you know, I had to do, use two feet, you know, changing the gears as well. And I was just in constant pain, just driving. Um, yeah, walking upstairs, especially if I had uh, a heavy bag. Um, then I started having rashes. It wasn't a bullseye rash, but it was just... Um, just these red, round rashes on my arms and legs, and they were very itchy. Um, 
and yeah, the fatigue um, that was started developing at the same time. I was a dancer, and all of a sudden, I I was having trouble dancing. Like it was just no energy at all. So, did you seek medical treatment for any of these symptoms that were developing when you were in your seventeenth, eighteenth year of life? I waited a bit, you know. I thought it would go away, but yeah, in about a year, I started going to doctors. I went to a dermatologist, and they said, you're probably reacting to a shampoo or soap, and told me to change it. I went for arthritis uh, to check, you know, if I have arthritis. They said, nope, nothing. Um, fatigue, I kind of mentioned to all the doctors, they kind of brushed it off. They said, oh, you're in school, you know, you're a student, blah, 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 you know, it's just normal. So when you came to the U.S., what were your new dreams? Uh, clearly, you were when you were in the Soviet Union, you were dreaming about coming to the U.S. and having the freedoms. And now you have all these freedoms um, here in the U.S. What kinds of new dreams did you have? I wanted to be a psychologist. I wanted to help people and um, adults and children. It was just something I really wanted to do. And why did you feel called to be a psychologist? I always wanted to understand the human mind and um, as much as I could, as I can. And um, I thought, you know, I've always been driven to help people. And I thought that would be a great profession to do so. So now when you were graduating from high school, did you move on to higher education in pursuit of your desire to become a psychologist? Yes, I went to college. I majored in psychology. I, my, I, I took a minor in criminal justice because at one point I did want to become an FBI agent <laughs> to do psychology profiling for FBI. So I studied in college all of that and then I went to grad school to psychology doctorate in grad school. So talk to us about how your symptoms were developing during that window of your life, after you graduated from high school, now during both your undergraduate and graduate studies. In college, um, in college, I definitely had them, but I kept just pushing through, you know, as a type A perfectionist, I can do this, you know, I worked, I studied, um, but in grad school, that's when they started getting so much worse that I couldn't, after first year, I was just, I, I was struggling. Um, and I started seeking more help, more, you know, going to more doctors, trying to figure this out. Uh, my brain fog just increased so bad. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't really study. I slept horribly. I woke up, you know, unrefreshed. I was dragging. I was seeing patients, and then I was just sleeping in between. Um, you know, we had like everybody had like their little rooms, you know, for seeing patients, and I just slept, slept in some <laughs> between the uh, the appointments. Um, so it was very, very, it was getting very difficult. So, Leanna, you you indicated that you had lived some time in your life in Connecticut as well. What window of time in your life did you live in Connecticut? Yeah, it was uh, 2000, um, we got married, uh, my husband and I, we got married, and we moved the next day. <laughs> so that was 2004, August 2004. Okay, so let's, let's sort of unbox that part of your life. So you, um, you, when did you meet your husband? Was this when you were in college, when you were in graduate school, or some other uh, window of your life? I was in high school, I, that's when I met him. Oh, okay. And so you, uh, where were you when you had gotten married? What stage in life did you get married in 2004? Uh, you mean how I felt or? No, no, where, where oh, you... I was in, uh, I was in, oh goodness. I think I was in grad school, but I might be mistaken. It, it might've been college. Were your symptoms having an impact on your relationship with your husband who you had met when you were in high school? Yes, definitely. I, I couldn't do as much, you know, I, you know, I did my best. I was still, I remember taking cooking classes and, you know, to be a good wife, <laughs> to cook for my husband, you know, and um, I remember I couldn't stand there to chop. So I would like have to sit 
and like try to chop, you know, and like cook everything and like lift things very carefully. So everything was kind of playing a role in how I did things. I was um, trying to be careful not to overdo. So yeah, I definitely did have symptoms, and uh, but my husband was very understanding, and he actually knew what he kind of had a feeling what was happening. Why don't you talk to us about that? How did your husband have a feeling about what was going on with you and your health? Well, he's been sick himself for years before he even met me. Um, he had mono when he was in college many years ago, and later on he went to develop chronic fatigue syndrome, and he had his own struggles over the years so when he saw me struggling he said I think you have same thing as me and he said you should go see my doctors now has your husband ultimately been diagnosed with Lyme disease as well yes how long did it take for your husband to receive his Lyme disease diagnosis we both kind of got it similar times <laughs> okay so he had symptoms but had not yet been diagnosed and then no. your symptoms began um, and he saw some parallels in the way that he was feeling and what he was observing in you. Correct. Correct. So now when you started going to your husband's doctors, were they misdiagnosing you in the same way that they had been misdiagnosing him? Yes. We were exploring the viral part and we both actually did have Epstein-Barr virus active and we were getting diagnosed as CFS nobody none of them were looking at Lyme at that time so now you indicated that almost immediately after getting married you left New York and you moved to Connecticut yes when you moved to Connecticut were you given any information about Lyme disease or ticks that would have allowed you to protect yourself from being reinfected with Lyme disease no now nothing nothing now do you believe that you were um infected when you were 17 or 18 or do you believe that it's possible that perhaps you were infected based on your relationship with your husband i believe it started when i was younger it's possible i kept getting reinfected later on and one of the doctors i saw recently she she said she kind of said the same thing that she thinks that i've been infected a few times now, do, you, do you believe that perhaps your husband was otherwise compromised and then after starting a relationship with you, perhaps he was infected with Lyme disease based on his relationship with you? Yes, possibly. It is. Yeah, it is all very, very possible. Okay. So now you said when you were in graduate school, things really got bad. Um, yes. How long after your marriage was the was the development of the really bad symptoms that resulted in you finally crashing? Um, well, after two years in grad school, I had to quit, um, and I've over and I was already married at the time for about a year to two years or so, and I decided to take some time off to get better, and I wasn't. Uh, then we, we were both kind of getting worse and we pursued, um, treatment, different treatment protocols. We, that's when we moved to Ohio to do some protocols with another doctor there. And we stayed there for a few years. Um, I was getting better than worse, better than worse. So for me, I definitely got worse around um, 2008, 2009. That's when I started really, really bad. So now were you able to work after you left graduate school and before you were diagnosed with Lyme disease? No, no, oh, yeah, everything kind of stopped. So now you indicated that you left Connecticut and moved to Ohio for the purposes of seeking treatment. Um, was that before or after you were diagnosed with Lyme disease? I got diagnosed in Ohio. Okay, so you and your husband were both declining in health while you were living in New York, then to Connecticut, and you decided to seek treatment in Ohio because you weren't getting adequate medical care either in New York or in Connecticut. Right, and uh, between, sorry, between Connecticut and Ohio, not to be confusing, we had a place in LA, 
So we kind of were by coastal at the time. So we did spend some time in LA and saw some doctors there who ran a um, few tests on us. Um, I was diagnosed with Babesia at the time, okay, but so, not Lyme. So when, um, were you, when were you first diagnosed with Babesia? That was in Los Angeles? Yeah, in Los Angeles, uh, I was positive for Babesia fish in 2009. And what treatment, if any, did the doctor provide to you after you were diagnosed with Babesia? Not much. He, he just said, okay, let's, you know, let's get your, let's put a step your immune system. That was, that was the treatment. Now, when you were diagnosed with Babesia, did the doctor tell you that you were likely infected with Babesia from a tick bite? Um, yes. He did say it was probably from a tick. So what did, what did that cause you to think about at that time? Um, you said you had never been in contact with ticks before that you knew of. So what, what did that make you think when you discovered that you were sick from coming in contact with a tick? Yeah, right away I thought, oh, it was from living in Connecticut probably or, you know, hike, you know hiking and um, camping in upstate New York. I kind of had a feeling that's what happened and started looking back and seeing how my symptoms developed and thinking that's, that was the origin. And why did you think it was in New York and Connecticut versus some contact with coming in, in uh, with a tick in Los Angeles? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, because my symptoms started, um, you know, around that time. So I thought that's, you know, that's what it was. So talk us more about your diagnosis in Ohio and why you believe you finally got a Lyme diagnosis in Ohio, but not in New York or Connecticut, where Lyme is so much more prevalent. Right. Well, and this, with this doctor in Ohio, you know, I started pushing for more, for more testing. I was the one who said, let's do these tests. Let's, you know, let's explore this. And he didn't even want to do it. And, you know, you need a doctor to order testing. So I found out which test to do and kind of, you know, was the one who said, let's, you know, come on, let's, <laughs> let's, let's look at this. And that's when my husband and I, we both, um, well, my husband got IgM positive uh, for Lyme and we had DNA positive for Lyme as well. And what doctor did you see in Ohio that actually ran these tests because you thought of them, not the doctor, and diagnosed you? Uh, I'd rather not say his name if it's okay, because we had a bed falling out. Um, and I just, I'm not a big fan. I would not want anybody to go see him. Totally understandable. <laughs> so now, before you left this doctor, did this doctor prescribe you with treatment for Lyme and co-infections, or did you leave shortly after your diagnosis? No. He didn't know how to treat it, and I had to Google everything and try to figure it out, and I was trying to read everything that I could find on the Internet to see what the treatment would be. Um, I called Dr. Horowitz's office in upstate New York, and I begged to be seen, and, you know, they wouldn't see me because, you know, he doesn't really see many patients, but I said, listen, come on, you know, I did all this testing and um, you know I'm a positive I really need to see him and you know I got the appointment so I flew in to see him and he kind of told me more about the treatment protocols and intracellular extracellular you know the film busters and all of the all of those things I even created like a whole spreadsheet of all the things that we should do and presented it to the Ohio doctor um, and that's when he decided to follow with my research that I even had no idea if I was right. Um, and um, that's the treatment that my husband actually started. So it sounds like you knew far more from your research than your doctor in Ohio. And then when you went to see Dr. Horowitz, he was more on the same page with you and understood Lyme and gave you some more information. And then you started to treat with Dr. Horowitz based on your research and his experience. Yes. <laughs> And now you mentioned your husband, though, started to treat based on your, your research alone. So did your husband start treating before you did? Yes, he started doing, um, he started doing the treatment, IVs, uh, antibiotics, and different things. And he started feeling um, better on the treatment. But 
after you know a few months, he started getting worse. So he was getting better, and then he started getting worse. Was he also treating with Dr. Horowitz, or did he find another doctor to prescribe him all this medication? No, that was the Ohio doctor. The Ohio doctor. So now talk to us what treatment you got with Dr. Horowitz based on your own research and your own data and Dr. Horowitz's experience. What was your treatment plan moving forward? So, you know, um, I'm kind of funny in this. You know, he gave me a hardcore treatment protocol, and I said, listen, I'm go- I want to go try stem cells. And he said, okay, why don't you do that first, and then we see how you do. So I went, because I didn't, I didn't want to do a lot of antibiotics and things like that. So I went to Panama to do the stem cells. And I felt a bit better after that. So I wanted to wait on antibiotics and all of that and see how I do. Well, because that was like not many of our guests that had stem cells or, or, or gone abroad to get stem cells. So what was that experience like for you going there? Was it something where you felt pretty you felt better pretty quickly or was it a gradual progression of your health? It was a gradual progression. I and started feeling slowly better um, over the months, you know, and my strength came back a little bit. I, my thinking, you know, my cognitive function came back a little bit more. I could do more in the day. So definitely was helpful. And now that you started to kind of plateau, so your stem cells helped a little bit, but you obviously weren't symptom-free yet, did you go back to Dr. Horowitz and start some other treatments? No. I started actually antivirals at the time, um, acyclovir for my EBV, and that also started helping me. So I was trying to avoid antibiotics as much as possible, not to, you know, not to destroy my gut, basically. So I was circling around and a cyclovir really helped me as well. And were you still a patient of Dr. Horowitz at this time or were you working with another doctor as well? I started working with another, another doctor in California. And now you felt a little bit better again. So here you are with stem cells getting a little bit better, plateauing. Now you're taking these antivirals, feeling a little bit better and sort of plateauing. And then what did you do next? We moved to California um, and um, I, I was feeling much better. I actually started driving the car again. I was walking a little bit more. And then one day I'm overdoing it. And next day I wake up and a bu- it's like a bus hit me. I cannot move. I'm in sweats. I can't think. I, it was a horrible relapse. And that was about six years ago. And now you're in California, I believe you said you have this relapse. So what did you do at this point? Did you go back to your original doctor? Did you find a new doctor? What were, your, what were your plans and actions at this time? Just to survive day by day. I was pretty bad, and um, I kind of learned to rely on myself over the years, so I kind of rely on my knowledge and try to pull myself out of relapses based on what I know. So I just started some supplements. I went to, back to acupuncture craniosacral therapy, chiropractor, and slowly I stabilized. Um, after a few months, I stabilized, but I did not come out of that relapse. You know, I, I wasn't as good as before, for sure. I was, I was still pretty bad. So did you essentially plateau again where you, you had this relapse, you were really bad. You, again, intuitively did your research and, and knowing your body did the right things to help yourself bounce back but then plateau at a point which was still worse than your pre-flare, I'm sorry, than your pre-relapse state, it sounds like. Yes, yes. And that's when I was trying to get a plan of action. What do I do? How do I get back to my, you know, my pre-relapse stage? You know, how do I help me and my husband? And that's when I reached out to Daisy White, um, a very well-known health advocate in the Lyme community and asked her if she would help me try to get a game plan. And um, she did. And I've been getting better since I started. um, She started helping me. We have to tell you that we have interviewed Daisy White and we are huge, huge fans of Daisy. And many of our past podcast guests have worked with her as as a health coach and have had major success. But 
before we explore that a little bit deeper, I want to ask you, how was your husband feeling at this point? Because you were sort of having these parallel Lyme journeys. Was he following the same course you were as far as treatment or was he deviating and doing different treatments? And how was he feeling at this time? Uh, he, he wasn't, he, he hasn't been feeling good for a long time. He, in Ohio, he got worse. Uh, and worse and worse, he he had a pick line for all the antibiotic IVs for Lyme, and that got infected. He went into sepsis, and um, I thought I was going to lose him that day, uh, that night, and um, he was shaking, holding my hand. We called 911, and, uh, you know, they started antibiotics, they pulled the line, and he pulled through. But he was never the same after that. That that took a huge toll on his body. Um, he got weaker, you know. He was he wasn't himself, you know. He it just was really bad. And um, after that, he was struggling. He ended up in the hospital two more times, uh, where he was, and each time he just got worse and worse. And um, and in the hospital at one point, uh, the nurse uh, kept looking at me like I was harming him. We actually had to call a psychologist to watch, to watch me at night to make sure I'm not harming my husband. So I was made like a pariah. <laughs> so, you know, he, because why is he keep landing in the hospital? Well, what are you doing to him? We are so sorry about, about your husband's health and and just to just to explore that a little bit further so these doctors at the hospital felt you were doing something to your husband in a malicious manner because yeah. it sounds like they didn't believe in chronic Lyme disease so it must have been the wife who's keep who's making her husband keep getting sick it sounds like yes yes and I would and I would be there because you know he really needed somebody at all times to help him you know go to the bathroom whatever and I just stayed on the couch in the hospital and um, they had somebody watching me. Do you think that your husband's health journey and the fact that all these doctors at the hospital felt you were somehow harming your husband had a negative impact on your own health and sort of prevented you from advancing at a level that you could have without that additional stress from your doctors, your husband's doctors and all that doubt that your husband's medical team had given you? Yes, unfortunately, I do think that that part of my life has definitely put a, such a huge stress on my body that it's definitely prevented me from getting better as much as I could, as I can. And, you know, personally, from my own experience and from speaking to a lot of others here on the podcast, we've learned that healing is a physical and an emotional journey. So do you feel that, you know, from an emotional standpoint, you've had to address your emotional health and your physical health to heal from Lyme disease? Absolutely. And, um, you know, I've, I've always been a positive person and always hoping and, um, you know, taking care of my husband at the same time as trying to take care of myself has been draining on all levels um, and definitely addressing all of them is something that I have been doing. <laughs> and now to kind of catch up to where we were with Daisy, you finally find Daisy White, who is an amazing health coach and has helped countless Lyme disease patients. What was that experience like and how is it different than anything you've ever done before in your Lyme journey? Well, I texted her because I couldn't really talk much on the phone these days. And, you know, I kind of, I said, okay, let's do this. And she said, you sure you don't want to like hear my voice? <laughs> and we're still joking about it. And I said, I'll, I'll live with it, you know? And, um, I didn't even know, you know, I just took a chance because, you know, I was in a dump. I was like, this is, you know, I need to do something and just, you know, focus and get help because I've always relied on myself and trying to figure this out. And it just became so draining that uh, I couldn't do it anymore. And especially when, you know, you feel like crap, you, you can't do it. Admittedly, I have to say that in the beginning of my Lyme journey, I, I just never saw the value of a health coach. But after almost 150 podcast episodes and advancing in my own health and, and really self-reflecting, 
there is a major, major advantage having a health coach work with you, which really I believe will help shortcut you to a, to a better health state in a quicker time than you could on your own. And is that something you would agree with that you feel like Daisy has sort of jump-started your healing journey a bit? Absolutely, because you know who you want to see then. You know what I mean? You don't waste your precious energy on seeing doctors who don't believe you or who don't know what to do with you. Um, even in the Lyme community, I'm sure there's a lot of doctors who, you know, who are not the best. So you really need to know who to see. And, um, you know, so you, fo- you, you, know, you, you focus and you, you start that work. So just to kind of recap, so you, you did stem cells, you kind of plateaued, then you did some antivirals, you sort of yep. plateaued. Never, you never wanted to go the antibiotic route because of all the damages to your gut, and we totally get that. Then you had this relapse and started self-treating with, with herbs and, and it sounds like diet and other things you did on your own and supplements, and you just really never got back to your pre-relapse state, so you hired Daisy White. Now, yep. what are you doing with Daisy White? What are your next steps to treat with Daisy? Okay, so... We have seen a few doctors. Um, I saw Dr. Cleanheart. I saw um, a doctor, um, I'm sorry, Dr. Holterf in L.A. and Dr. Lehman in L.A. And this is my new team of doctors who are helping me um, with my protocols, kind of putting everything together. Uh, My next steps are... Uh, I have to do dental surgery, um, you know, since dental health is so huge for uh, any anybody with a chronic illness. Um, so I have that scheduled um, in April where I have some crowns with metal underneath, um, and they're, they're really old as well, so I need to change them anyway, but they're going to be switched to implant non-metal implants and um, i have some cavitations uh to clean out and um yeah that's my next uh, part of my journey <laughs> and i'm also doing stem cells with dr lehman in la um as well as exosomes i'm doing peptide therapy and i'm taking disulfiram for lyme uh, that i found very helpful Sulfiram seems to help a lot of people with their with their Lyme disease, but it sounds like something that has to kind of start very gradually and you have to sort of get your feet wet to make sure that you're going to respond well to it. So is that the approach you took with Daisy where you kind of tried disulfiram to see if it was going to be a good fit for you? And when you had some positive results, you just kind of went a little bit further with it and, and continued on with the, with the treatment protocol? Correct. I started very, very low to see how I do. And uh, I've been doing, I'm still doing it small dose, um, and I'm doing four times a week. You also mentioned that you're doing peptides as well. Do you feel that peptides have helped you in your health journey too? Yes. Um, There's a lot of peptides on the market, so you definitely need a good doctor who knows what's what. Um, I am doing a few of them. I'm rotating uh, as well after seeing my doctors, Um, but that's something that's huge. I think it has huge potential for many people. You also mentioned that you're taking exosomes as well, which I believe are, are related to stem cells somewhat. Yes. So can you talk to us more about what exosomes are and how they're helping you in your healing journey? Uh, they are growth factors and um, just for the, the repair. And um, I did them a few times in Los Angeles um, after I did the stem cells. So they kind of go together. Um, just to help, um, you know, rebuild everything. And the stem cells you're doing now in, in California with Dr. Lehman, are they different than the ones you did in Panama early on in your journey? Because I know there's different types of stem cells and different ways to administer stem cells and different quantities. So is this a different approach or do you think that your body's at a different place now and just more uh, able to, to re- react to these stem cells than it was early on in your journey? I think they're pretty similar. They're mesenchymal stem cells, and um, I believe that's what I got in Panama as well. Um, actually, it's so funny because when I had them again in California, I tasted them. You know, it's like this sweet, weird sweet taste, and they're administered IV, 
And I remembered, I was like, oh, this tastes exactly like in Panama. I'm, I'm pretty sensitive, but a lot of people do taste, um, you know, when they get IVs, you know, you have that taste. <laughs> so it does taste the same. <laughs> I know there's a lot of companies who are coming out with the new stem cell products, so I'm sure there's some differences and how much you get. I believe I got 15 million of stem cells in um, IV the last time I was in California. So your current medical team is Dr. Lehman from California and Dr. Klinghart, I believe, from New York. So are you seeing Dr. Klinghart telehealth or are you flying to New York to uh, see Dr. Klinghart as well? No, I saw Dr. Klinghart in, um, he's, um, he's in uh, Switzerland and he's also in um, Washington. So I saw him in um, Switzerland. Okay. And that's what the... Um, uh, the dental clinic is. That's where I'm doing my dental um, in April. So talk to us more about that because many people are doing a lot of things and aren't getting better. And we've heard a lot about your dental health and your oral health really having an impact in, in preventing you from recovering from Lyme disease and a lot of toxicity that could exist from cavities and fillings and things like that. So if people are curious about this, how can you explain why your dental health could have such a negative impact on your healing from Lyme disease? Um, you know, I am new to this as well. You know, it's kind of been in the back of my mind. I did not want to deal with it because uh, I've been traumatized by, by um, dentists and dental work. So, you know, when Dr. Cleanheart said, you have to do this to get better, you're stuck, you know, you really need to get your mouth clean, you know, so, you know, the treatments would work better. So I, I finally, you know... And Daisy also <laughs> is like, hello, you know, you have to do this. So I am totally traumatized from my past experience with the dentist. And, you know, I flew to Switzerland to see the clinic, you know, to get comfortable. And they were incredibly nice and explained the whole process and how important it is to your whole body, you know, health, um, you know, any amal you know, amalgams and um, any other metals that's in your mouth. I have posts right now, I have a metal post under my crowns uh, that are actually separating. They couldn't even identify what the metal was, um, and they were like, well, you know, this is some weird stuff. <laughs> so they do need to take it out. Um, you know, there's a lot of bacteria that can, um, that can be created by this. There's, you know, heavy metal toxicity, and a lot of patients with any chronic illness um, have issues, um, you know, with detox, genetically predisposed, or from just having more exposure from um, just living in this world, you know. Um, there's a lot of heavy metals, and, um, you know, there's just one thing that we need to take care of so our body's functioning better you know, cavities, if there's root canals, um, they're also, you know, that's breeding ground for more bacteria. And I did hear that a lot of Lyme and co-infections do live in your jaw. We've actually heard from past guests that have had their saliva tested and, you know, cells from their mouth tested, and they've actually found the spirochetes in their saliva and in their, in their you know, their gums. So I think it's pretty well established that Lyme likes to sort of settle in, the, in, your, in your mouth as well and in your teeth. So my takeaway from what you've basically explained so far with your Lyme journey is you were sort of researching on your own and you're obviously very smart and you've came up with a lot of good information on your own because Lyme healing is very difficult for people in this in this this world especially with it being so controversial but then you you partner with Daisy and you have this whole body approach so you're using stem cells to repair your body exosomes to kind of help repair as well you're removing things that are keeping you sick like like these all this dental work to kind of remove this constant toxin load in your body and you're also using disulfiram to kill off the Lyme bacteria and potential other bacteria, you're using antivirals to, to, to reduce the viral load. And all of these things together are now having a positive impact on your health from a whole body approach to heal the body rather than focus on one particular thing that may be wrong with you. Absolutely. And that's how every patient should be approached by any doctor out there. You know, we're individual uh, people. We have, we come with our own genetics and you know, our own environmental exposures and 
we just every, everybody needs to get as much testing as possible to get to the root causes. You know, look at mold, heavy metals, uh, candida, viruses, bacteria, um, and you know all sorts of things, and just and hormones. You know, and um, and try to get a comprehensive plan, and um, you know, go at it. Let's talk about that for a second, hormones, because Lyme seems to really alter hormones and create either a fight or flight mode where people get stuck in or really impact people in a negative way. And I don't think enough people really think about their hormones when they're staying sick with Lyme disease. Can you talk more to that point and what people should look at from a hormone perspective if they're still ill from Lyme disease? Yes, uh, definitely looking at um, adrenals and thyroid, one of the major major um, hormones that, um, you know, a lot of chronic illness uh, patients um, have issues with. You know, adrenals are constantly getting um, stressed. If you have a lot of heavy metals or a lot of viral or bacterial load, um, and we definitely need to support them. Um, there's, you can do cortisol testing, a saliva cortisol test, uh, four times a day to see what it is that will show if you're in a fight or flight mode or, you know, and what you need to do. You, for thyroid, um, you know, the doc, you, usually doctors will just run TSH and that's not enough. You need to look at the thyroid antibodies. You need to look at reverse T3, total T4, and, um, you know, just do the whole thyroid panel to see, to see what it is. And that's, uh, that gets missed a lot. You have given us such a clear picture here of so many different parts of the body that have to be addressed. And when we say Lyme disease, it really is not just Lyme, right? There's so much more to the picture. And I think you're, found, you're addressing all of those components. And I know you're just really in the middle of this now with this whole body approach, but are you seeing any res results now? Or do you think that you're just too, too early in this journey and you may be having some herxing reactions at this point? But I'm trying to get an idea of where your health is at today and, uh, you know, where you see yourself being in a few months from now and a year from now working with Daisy White? I am definitely uh, better than I was about two years ago when, you know, I contacted Daisy about a year and a half or to two years. I can't remember now. And, you know, I couldn't even talk at the time, you know, and when I saw her, I could barely even spend a few minutes with her. So I'm definitely better. I can have a conversation with you guys on the phone. <laughs> I can... Oh, for, you know, not too long, but I can still do it. And, you know, I can walk a little bit more. I can um, do more things during the day. So definitely a stable improvement. Of course, if you have a Herx reaction, you know, you'll have a setback. But, um, you know, you just kind of got to keep going. And for me, I feel like I'm on the right, I'm finally on the right path. I finally, I'm finally doing all the testing. I'm finally um, addressing um, as much as I can and uh, treating and have a comprehensive plan. Um, after my dental surgery, um, you know, which I'm not looking forward to, but <laughs> I'm looking forward to the time right after it where I can, um, I feel like that will be a major shift in my body. And, um, you know, I'll keep going at it. Leanna, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about uh, your health coach. And as Matt had shared with you, we, we think very highly of Daisy White. Can you talk about some of the other things that she's done with you in coaching? You indicated that she's helped you to find new doctors. But one of the things that we, we admire about health coaches, and that's more of a, a West Coast and an East Coast phenomenon. We never heard of health coaches here on the East Coast. Um, is that they can push you further than you'd push yourself. So can you talk to us about how Daisy's helping you to, for example, do things like go forward with your, your dental surgery um, that you wouldn't have done without the help of a coach? Yeah, I definitely wouldn't have done it without her. So that's something that even when I first met her, she said, okay, you have to, by the way, she said you should do the, um, you know, the 3D x-ray to look at your dental health. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and after she, you know, she saw, she's like, Ooh, you know, that's something that we really need to address. So, you know, she's really big on this and, 
you know, I said, oh, my God, I, I don't, I really don't want to do this. Even though I said, you know, I'll do anything. And then dental stuff, I'm like, oh, God, you know, I, I don't want to do this. But deep down, I know I just have to get through it. And, you know, together by seeing other doctors, I'm prepping my body, getting it stronger so I can get through the surgery because it's not an easy, you know, feat. You know, for somebody like me, I have to go under, you know, it's, few hours long then you know all the healing but she will be with me you know she's going with me to switzerland um you know to make sure i don't run out of the you know not run out but roll out on my wheelchair out of the hospital be like i'm out of here she'll make sure i'm there (laughs) but she also will be there um during my recovery to help and communicate uh with uh, you know she is my voice She's my voice with all the doctors. She helps me put the treatment protocols together, um, combine everything that, you know, other doctors uh, suggest, and kind of we decide together. You know, she's not like, oh, you got to do this and this, but we decide together. And um, it's great to have somebody who understands you, but it's also great to have her knowledge because she's been in the Lyme community for many years, I've been in the CFS community where, you know, my knowledge came from, um, you know, knowing a lot about viruses and, you know, all of that. So Lyme is something is is new to me uh, theoretically because, you know, I didn't really look into it, um, you know, until really a um, few years back. Uh, but really her knowledge of how to treat Lyme effectively and what we need to do. You know, Leanna, another thing I think Lyme, coaches in particular or someone who has had Lyme disease and now is coaching health in particular can help you with is to determine when you should pivot from one treatment protocol to another because treatments from Lyme disease are not linear and uh, and there's going to be some differences in every single person's experience and having someone like Daisy who had Lyme disease herself and has learned how to coach people through these challenges can help you to learn when to pivot from one treatment protocol to another. Can you talk to us about how Daisy has helped you with that? Yeah, absolutely. If something's not working, I've hit a plateau where I'm not sure on the dose or, you know, I can always talk to her and, you know, she'll say, okay, you know, let's increase, decrease, stop, let's see, you know, let me talk to the doctor, let me see what's, you know, what the next step should be, and, you know, her knowledge with other patients of what happened, you know, during their healing journey, so, but yeah, definitely something that, um, you know, I feel very confident, and I trust her, you know what I mean, I trust her knowledge. So now, let's talk about how you chose a health coach, right? I, I noticed from your Instagram, and we're going to talk about Instagram in a minute, but I noticed from your Instagram that your favorite book is uh, Atlas Shrugged and written by uh, another Russian immigrant who spoke a lot about and, and taught a lot about individual responsibility. So how do you balance your philosophy as someone who strongly believes in personal responsibility and making your own decisions in working with someone who's now going to coach you and assist you through the coaching process? You know, I'm a huge believer in personal freedom and especially when it comes to medical decisions, I will always say um, you have to decide on your own what you want to do to your body everybody you know that's the freedom don't let anybody tell you what you should or shouldn't do you should make you should do your own research and you should do your own decision um i with daisy it's very easy with me you know she never tells me exactly what to do you know she presents the facts and still the decision is mine you know what i will do so has there been any sort of um, revisiting of your experience during your childhood with Chernobyl and the exposure you had to radiation? No, I, I haven't really visited that. Um, I don't think, I'm not sure if there's a, a way to figure out if it had any impact on me other than just my intuition that it did. Um, but no. So let's now talk about Instagram and your life as an influencer. Uh, You have an unbelievably beautiful Instagram and it has become 
now part of uh, part of your career. So talk to us about how you were introduced to Instagram and why you started your Instagram page. Uh, we were living in Ohio at the time. Well, first, thank you. <laughs> but we were living in Ohio, and, um, you know, my husband was sick. You know, I'm sick and just, you know, really struggling, you know, not not having friends or, you know, not having the communication with the outside world, basically. Just because doing, you were so sick. Yes, you're just so sick. You're just trying to survive day to day. And my assistant, Allison, said, why don't you start an Instagram page and start posting pictures? And I said, you know, this is silly. What am I going to post pictures of? And she said, just, you know, whatever. So I said, okay. <laughs> and then I started my page, and, you know, I was posting flowers and, you know, and then I noticed all the fashion pages, and I always loved fashion. And, um, you know, I saw people posting their outfits, but then, you know, shoes and bags, and I thought that was the silliest thing. And all of a sudden, I decided to start doing the same thing. <laughs> and uh, that way, I started connecting with people on Instagram and talking about fashion and taking my mind off. Um, everyday things and I wasn't really sharing with anybody what I was going through you know we were just talking about um, colors and bags and shoes and you know just designers all of that stuff and um, slowly I, my page started growing and you know I've always loved color I've always loved to dress up even to my doctor's appointments or IV whatever <laughs> and um, you know I started taking pictures of my outfits and posting them so first talk to us about your use of color. Why is color an important element of your page and your philosophy? Uh, I've always loved color from many years. It just always made me happy. And when I got sicker, I, I was more drawn to it. And I felt like I just needed to wear this color or that color that day. And it just made me happy. And, um, you know, it made me feel normal and, um, you know, I do color meditations and, you know, chakra meditations where, you know, you concentrate in different colors. And that's, um, that's something that really resonates with me. So Matt talked to you a little bit earlier about mindset and the impact that mindset has on healing. It's clear that you determined first that you were going to be happy despite being sick but even more importantly you determined that happiness was an important emotion for you to heal so can you talk about how the development of your instagram page helped you to be happy and ultimately aided you in your healing journey and you know a lot of people talk about how bad social media is on their mental health but for me it was it was like a godsend it was it was so wonderful to connect with people um, and to share and, you know, and to share, you know, just happy pictures, you know what I mean? And it really has helped me take my mind off of everyday suffering that, you know, we're going through. And um, it's been instrumental in, in just distracting me. <laughs> but now... You know, as my page has grown, I really want to raise awareness um, about what the invisible illnesses um, are and what the life with them could be. That, you know, behind pretty pictures, there's a lot of pain and suffering. And hopefully, well, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so let's talk about that. So, the, yeah. so one of the things you've done very tastefully and I think very beautifully is that you've shown yourself to be suffering from uh, from a disability where some of your pictures uh, include you uh, in a wheelchair or near a wheelchair and some of your pictures you are uh, showing that you have a cane. So talk about how you've begun to bleed into your page with all of these beautiful images and all of this fashion, the story of your um, illness. I've always been very private, um, you know, there was a there's a reason why I shut down for years for you know not talking about the illness because of all the bad previous experiences off sharing with people and you know not going well you know they're questioning you and all of that so I kind of shut down and just focus on the fashion pretty you know pretty pictures you know beauty in the world that's that's what I wanted to showcase um, and then last year I I started to feel better. 
and I wanted to share, um, um, you know, my journey. Then pandemic happened, and I just kind of said, you know what, this is just too much happening. You know, I, I don't want to do it. So I kind of put it on a you know back burner, and then eventually this year I finally um, came out and started sharing my journey in hopes that, um, you know, that people learn about it and um, learn about what the chronic Lyme is and how debilitating it could be, how it affects people, and hope that um, there will be more kindness in the world and not que- you know not questioning and not telling people they're crazy because that's that has such a detrimental effect on people's um, mindsets you know when they're struggling and you know their friends and family tell them they're crazy. So one of the things I think is really beautiful about your page is not just the color, which is beautiful, and the imagery, which is beautiful, but also the messaging. And part of what your message is, is although you're sick and suffering from a chronic illness, you're not identifying as a sick person. You're identifying as a powerfully happy person who's very fascist conscious. So can you talk to us about how you're not only encouraging people to understand more about chronic illnesses and be more sympathetic to people who are going through these challenges, but how you're also trying to convey the message that happiness and identity are very important elements of healing. Absolutely. You know, we're not um, just, you know, we're not just one thing where, you know, there's, we're, for me, um, it's important for me to tell people to hope and to dream and to do their best, even though I know it's so incredibly difficult to get through each day um, when, you know, when you're sick or when you have any, any other illness or really any other issue in life. It's so incredibly important to try to focus on positives and, um, you know, I know we all have our days and that's okay, you know what I mean? But just overall, just to keep hoping and dreaming and, um, you know, to keep going forward. Now, part of the way that you convey this identity of both being happy and being something other than identifying with your illness is that you get dressed up before your treatment. So we've seen many photos of you portrayed on your Instagram page where you're hooked up to an IV or you're getting some other form of treatment. You're dressed beautifully. So can you talk about why you're using the colors and and why you're dressing the way you are when you go for your treatments. Yeah, it just makes me feel normal, you know. I is, you know, like a human being that I it's just something that's important for me to uh, to do, you know. Some days and you know in the past I I didn't have energy to even dress up. So for me, that's like a win, you know, that I can do it myself. I can dress up, and uh, even though, you know, I have to get in the wheelchair and go, but I can carry my own bag, which I couldn't before. You know, I can I can do this. It's like a win for me. And also, it just makes me feel like a human being, you know, like normal. <laughs> So can you talk to us about what your plans are for the future of your page? Because little by little, you are now introducing many powerful concepts about identity and mindset and small wins and small victories and and, um, all of these other types of very important emotional and mindset concepts. What is the future for your page and how are you going to help the community in addition to both the awareness and the treatment issues you've discussed? I will see how it goes. Um, you know, usually I try not to plan these days as much because plans backfire a lot of times <laughs> for me personally. Um, but my goal is is to ra- raise awareness as much as I possibly can, talk about it as, as much as I can. Uh, you know, talking to you guys is something that's, uh, you know, like a f- huge first step for me, telling my story. I was planning to write a little bit about my story on my website. Um, just, you know, combining fashion <laughs> and um, treatments, you know, talking, talking about what, behind, what goes behind the scenes, you know, a little bit more. Um, 
so yeah, that's that's my goal, and we'll see how it goes. So talk to us about what triggered this transformation in you from portraying images of happiness and fashion generally so that you would feel more normal and you wouldn't identify with your disease to now becoming someone who's now an activist in the community where you're portraying your experiences more and more to the point where you've now spent over an hour telling your entire story on a long form podcast. Um, definitely feeling better, you know, that I can concentrate, you know, in the past, you know, when, uh, when I went through this horrible, horrible few years where I was just trying to survive day to day, you know what I mean? Even thinking about closing my page many times because I couldn't, I couldn't handle, I couldn't even, you know, just lifting the phone was a, was, was so difficult for me and you know replying because it's very important for me to interact with my followers you know I, I make it uh, a decision that I have to reply to every single person <laughs> you know because they take their time to you know to give me a compliment or to ask a question you know it's important for me to you know to reply so you know it was very it was it was starting to get very very difficult and you know for me i was just just trying to get through each day but as i started getting better you know that you know that made me realize that i need to talk about this more too because you know social media can be very one sided and you know people say you know, I want your life, you know, you, you have such a wonderful life and, you know, I'm so jealous, you know, things like that. And I really wanted to showcase that, um, you know, there's a lot of other things that are going on behind this life and behind many, many other people's lives who choose not to speak about, speak out and the importance of um, being understanding and kind because there's a lot of bullying as well going on on social media and, um I'm just trying to, um, you know, showcase as much as I can. So let me ask you the final question we ask all of our guests on the podcast. And let's assume one of your followers, who you always have to answer, sent you now a DM or a post on your Instagram where they asked you what they should do after finding themselves bitten by a tick. What recommendation would you make to them so they wouldn't have to go on a terrible chronic Lyme disease journey? I would say, um, do you have the tick? <laughs> do you still have the tick? If you have the tick, send it to IgenX or another company that could, you know, I'm not sure if there are other ones, but I know that IgenX can test the tick to see what bacteria they have. Um, and then I would say, if you don't have a tick, um, to find a Lyme literate doctor, and I would um, I would try to help them. Where do they, Where do you live? What state? I would try to you know Google to see, if, or if I know somebody in that state, and then um, tell them to go and which test to run, and um, I would help them as much as I can with the knowledge I have, and um, you know guide them, which I already have been doing a little bit. You know, some people have messaged me. And I have helped them a little bit, hopefully help them, but try to say, okay, this, you know, this is what you should do. And I also would um, tell them to go listen to your podcast because there's a lot of good information there as well. Thank you for listening to the Tick Boot Camp interview with Liana of Panthea in Style. To our listeners, we have a call to action. First, if you'd like to learn more about Liana and Panthea in Style, please visit our Instagram page at Panthea in Style. Second, if you enjoyed this episode of the Take Bootcamp podcast, please share with your friends by using the social media buttons at the bottom of our post. Third, Tick Bootcamp has created a Tick by Blueprint that has been inspired by the information that has been provided to us by past podcast guests. We urge you to visit our website at www.tickbootcamp.com to view the blueprint. Please note we would appreciate any input or improvements you would like to share with us. Fourth, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify to get your automatic episode updates of our Tick Bootcamp podcast. And finally, please take a minute to leave us an honest review and rating on iTunes or on our website. Thank you, as always, for listening.